Good morning, everybody. I thought, I thought it might be good this morning uh, initially just to say, let's all just say thank you to the people running this meeting. This is a really big, complicated thing. They're, they're really doing a fantastic job. What I like to do in these meetings in this session is just basically give a, a, a report from the front line of one of America's uh, fast-moving, uh, I said one of, one of America's fast-moving, change-oriented universities. We're, we're really involved in trying to do everything that we can to change the idea of the university, the purpose of the university, the function of the university, the impact of the university. So what I really want to do today is see if we can get more ideas from you more solutions from you, more things that we can use, more ways that we can advance, more ways that we can impact students, more ways that we can make things happen. And the way to do that, in my mind, is to begin the serious process of changing who we think the learner is and what we think the role of college and universities are. So put on your design cap and start thinking like an architect as we work, as we work our way through this. Just the concept of design, nothing new about it, to create, to fashion, to execute, to construct, to devise, we all are living inside a design, and I like to say, and let me just repeat it, that the design that we're living in is producing the best products that it can produce. We're leaving behind 20% of the high school students, they don't graduate. Half the kids that go to college don't graduate. Only 8% of the students from the bottom quarter of family incomes in the United States have any chance. If you're born into that family income status, you have an 8% chance of getting a college degree. In 1970, it was 7%. Not much progress. The design produced that. The design. It's a function of that's what the design can produce. Universities are built like this. Trains on hard tracks. Slow, cautious, incremental, highly impactful. But just keep in your mind. Now, there's other kinds of ways to design things. This is a jet engine. A jet engine is a completely different conceptualization. It can be applied to different things. It can be, it can be driven, it can be uh, modified, it can be used in different ways. It's more flexible. It's even more complex than the train. Again, just thinking like designers. Now, it's a sad situation. We hadn't figured out how to attack polio, but we needed a solution for people that had contracted polio. Iron lung machines, thousands and thousands and thousands of them. While at the same time, we needed to rethink. And this is the mistake where most people say universities are highly innovative. These machines came from universities. The ideas came from universities. And the solution, the vaccination, came from highly trained, academically oriented scientists. And so people say, oh, those institutions are innovative. They certainly are. But the most important thing is that the previous slide was the manifestation of treating the disease. The need was really to prevent the disease because the disease, once it entered the body, was devastating. And the key was the need, the need. It turns out now that the structure of the way that we organize learning, rigid structures, kindergarten, then you go to elementary school, then you go to middle school, then you go to high school, and then you go to some other kind of school, and then you start your life. What is that? But a rigid, structured design that's probably not the way that things actually work. So what's the purpose of design? So here's the way we do things now. I love this video because I hate this way of teaching. So let's watch this video. The old way. assured destruction. Today, any nuclear country or terrorist is capable of inflicting damage on a massive scale with weapons of... Environmental entropy. The polar ice caps aren't waiting for us to decide if climate change is real. Rising coastal waters, intensifying weather patterns, they're all punching our one-way ticket to... Dystopia. By definition, not perfect. Huxley's Brave New World, Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451, Orwell's 1984. Once considered fiction, these futuristic novels are actually happening right now and they seem to be getting worse. Yes, Miss Newton. Can we fix it? Sorry? I get things are bad, but what are we doing to fix it? Have a good weekend, everybody. Oh my gosh. <laughs> So, just like we heard in the last discussion with Arnie Duncan, the kids who are empowered by social media, empowered by technology, think differently, can self-assemble, can move forward at social scale, who can engage issues and problems at democratic scale, that last view, they're sick of it. They're sick of it. 
That's somewhere between archaic and worthless as a teaching method. People want to solve problems. People want to learn at their own speed. People do not want to sit in just only regular classrooms and raise their hand and have some teacher speak to them in the way that these teachers speak. Now, this will not be the future, but this could be a future. This is technology at the maximum extreme. So we're going to go ahead and look at the young Vulcan, Mr. Spock. Mr. Spock, the next video. What is the formula for the volume of a sphere? Four thirds pi times the radius cubed. One point two six. Any limbs? Charge of an additional scalar distance. What is the square root of three hundred ninety-six thousand three hundred twenty-four? What is the dimensionality? Dimensionality equals the logarithm of n divided by non-excludability and non-rival. Four thirds pi times the radius. When it is morally praiseworthy, but not morally obligatory. Obviously, we don't live on Vulcan, and we're not Mr. Spock, but that was highly individualized, highly engaged, highly personalized, highly in advanced, high-speed adaptive learning. Now, we're not going to end up there because it turns out we're human, and we learn in different ways. We learn together. We learn emotionally. We learn in lots of different ways, but the notion of somehow freeing ourselves from the former structure, the former design, and so forth is really important. So this is what I was describing before, the distinct life stages the way things work now. You have your careers after your education. Lifelong education is a thing that a few of us are engaged in, kind of personally on the side. We call that reading. <laughs> so it's a little bit, uh, it could be greatly enhanced beyond reading. And so this model, this model is really at the core of our problem. It's why we're afraid of what will happen with autonomous vehicles. It's why we're afraid of what will happen with more and more artificial intelligence. It's because we don't know how to prepare people to learn and adapt, learn and adapt, learn and adapt, lifelong learning, individualized learning all the time, learning in a different way. So a new model, universal learning, universal learner. Yes, you're going through phase learning, the blue, the green, the gold. You become a lifelong learner when you're prepared to become a lifelong learner. The university helps to prepare, if it works correctly, a lifelong learner empowered to learn anything. And then in the, in the gold and the red phase, as you move uh, later into years, your jobs, your personal fulfillment, your life, and so forth, you're continuously involved in learning, continuously engaged in learning. So a new design, again, it's about design, universal learning, so a direction that we're moving in, and I'm going to fly through this. We're trying to build a model where the university can be a home to learners that come to learn with us at a particular point in their life, and then also a place that can be accessible to learners anywhere, anytime, at any place, drawing from the combined energy of the learners, the faculty, the students, the staff, the, the library, the support mechanisms, everything of the university itself. And imagine universities working in this modality. Now, I've showed a version of this slide in the past. These are the innovations that we need. We need infinitely scalable teaching. We need personalized learning at scale. We need development-based assessment. We need artificial intelligence-based advising. And I've divided these innovations up, and we can get this, uh, this entire uh, presentation to all of you. These are the things that we need. So those of you that are in the venture business, those of you that are in the technology business, those of you that are in the thinking business and the research business and the learning assessment business, these are the tools that we need to be able to go from the core of the university, the knowledge core, and make things happen in a different way, upper right education through exploration. This is virtual augmented reality for, for learning. Well, of course, a lot of people are working on this, but if you do it separated from the knowledge core, separated from the faculty, separated from the library, separated from the knowledge creation process, it'll be nothing but a gizmo. It'll have no material impact whatsoever. So, quickly, we need to design the phone, not the transistor. We need to design the system. Right now, we're designing incremental in instruments. We're devising and designing in incremental tools. We need to create a design culture in education. It's absent from the way K-12 schools work, the way community colleges work. They are bureaucracies operated as government agencies, for the most part, incapable of operating on a design basis. So look at the upper right. Keep a nimble pace. Focus on continuous improvement. Bottom middle. Take risks and use lessons to design new iterations. We have not built this into, it's kind of funny almost, almost ironic. Our learning institutions are not learning institutions. <laughs> Our institutions charged with creating innovators and entrepreneurs are neither innovative or entrepreneurial. And so We've been doing these kinds of things at ASU, starting new programs, new units, new activities, new structures, new ways of doing things. 
Uh, we're working with Salesforce, for the largest higher ed user, but we're looking at unifying and linking the student experience and moving into artificial intelligence systems. We're, we've built an action lab with private sector partners and others that's now looking at this one root problem that we have. The biggest resistance to technological integration in K-12 and the rest of the educational hierarchy are the teachers themselves. The teachers themselves are the resistors. And so it's because they don't know whether or not these technologies work. They don't know the efficacy of these technologies. We built a master's in global security, six months to design it. It's deployed. It has students from all over the world. Education for humanity. We're working around the world, taking the technology platforms that we have. Now we realize that we have learning assets, learning tools, learning modalities, learning mechanisms, learning stimulation mechanisms, and we can work at all scales, including with the millions of people who are without schools, in refugee situations, and displaced from their homes, and their families are disrupted. So we couldn't do that before, we can do that now. Expansion of our open scale offerings, operating, offering learning opportunities to the lifelong learner across all things. Now again, you might say, well, what, what happened to the university along the way? You must have blown that up. We didn't blow it up. It's the source, it's the nuclear reactor producing these ideas. The students coming to the university are now working with the team to produce the learning environment. 15,000 of our students are employed. 30,000 of our students are engaged in the research enterprise itself. This enterprise then is able to offer across open scale platforms with technologies from some of you all, learning opportunities across the lifespan of humans. What is the value of digital education? Is it actually, does it actually have impact? Does it have, does it have learning outcome impact? The answer is yes. Does it expand and enhance learning outcomes for, for many people? Yes, particularly older people. Uh, does it have economic return? Can you lower the cost per unit of learning instruction in a way where it's no longer, there's no longer a financial barrier? The answer is yes, yes, yes. And so the Boston Consulting Group worked with us and we've advanced this notion of the value of digital education and we can share all of that with you. We've built alliances with other universities. So we're now offering a nuclear engineering degree at ASU, but the faculty is in Sydney, Australia, augmenting our chemical engineering faculty so that we don't have to waste money to build something that already exists somewhere else. Ask yourself why colleges and universities only have leagues for athletics. Stupid. We need to have more than leagues for athletics. We need leagues for engineering and leagues for humanities and leagues for the Thai language and leagues for French and this and this and this and this. All about the design. Every college and every university sits out there and says, I'm smart enough, I'm capable enough, I'm going to solve all these things myself. We built a university innovation alliance. Eleven schools coming together saying, can we innovate together? Can we innovate together? Ohio State, Purdue, Michigan State, Arizona State, Oregon State, Iowa State, Central Florida, Georgia State, UC Riverside, uh, Kansas, Texas. Uh, these schools have all come together and they said, we can learn to innovate together and we're going to greatly increase the number of students from lower income families, that lower quartile of family incomes. We're already at 25% increase over baseline. We believe that by the time we're done with our first phase, we'll be uh, in, uh, about 150,000 more graduates from lower income families from these 11 universities than we would have normally produced. Now that's a heck of an outcome by learning how to innovate together, and it goes back to design. Universities are designed not to collaborate. Faculty collaborate, universities don't collaborate. It's the funniest thing. We're working with uh, Draper and GSV and have built an accelerator. We're running through more than a dozen companies connected to our educational platform so that those companies can advance themselves. This, again, is design, 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 new kinds of partnerships. If, if we had 50 universities doing this or 100 universities doing this, we'd be advancing hundreds, if not thousands, of new technologies into the field after use demonstration. Now, I'm kind of a weirdo, and so I like science fiction. There was a book written by uh, Neil Stevenson in 1996 called The Diamond Age. Anybody read that book? It's a fantastic book. It's a fantastic book. And then in the book is a thing called the Young Lady's Primer, or Primer, depending on how you pronounce it. And it's a machine, a device. If you touch the device, it knows who you are, it becomes psychologically connected to you, and it becomes from toddler forward, from infant forward, becomes your teaching tool that enhances your learning. And in Neil Stevenson's Diamond Age scenario, only rich kids have access to it. We are on the path to that. We are on that path. So uh, sometime after the book came out in 2011, uh, a guy put together this kind of roadmap here. It's not so much the details, but he said, if you wanted to build the young lady's illustrated primer, 
wanted to build it, here were all the component parts. In 1996, almost none of them existed. You can see the, the parts, adaptive tutoring in the upper left, uh, independent critical uh, thinking on the right, uh, game characteristics, learning progression, transferability, uh, narrative interaction, cognitive apprenticeships, uh, uh, vanishing scaffolding, all these things. You're, and this is, this is an unbelievable thing if you haven't read the book. So we said, okay, why don't we take the learning experience and now move into a new modality, a new design of learning. Maybe we can find a group of kids today in 2018, organize them into a skunk works, make it a part of their learning experience and build this thing. So let's watch the next video. The Axio platform is, I think, uh, a platform meant for the individual and their, their personalized growth and their learning. This platform is somewhere someone goes to advance themselves and that, you know, through that it's facilitated by this AI companion. It has the ability just to talk to you. We truly believe this can be the first project that facilitates this lifelong learning among everybody, no matter what part of your life you're in, no matter your age, no matter your demographic. You can think of, of it as a, as a Wikipedia of digital learning, which anybody from anywhere could use. They could contribute, curate, and advance the repository of data, of the knowledge base that we have. Whenever I'm doing anything with Axio, with the visuals, if it looks cool, if it doesn't look cool, I always have to stop and say, is this on? purpose for us is this driving the point that Axio is a friendly AI companion and that it's here to drive value into your life. Hello Cece, how are you doing today? I'm doing well today Axio. Is there anything I can do to help you? I've been thinking about traveling lately. How exciting, let's see, where are you thinking of going? I'm thinking about going to Italy, there's some art I want to see. You can think of it as a guide which is not paid, which is with you all the time and which sees what you are studying and what you want to study. You can set your goals into it. It will be surrounding you, it will be around you. At the same time, it's not gonna uh, intrude into your privacy. I think it should be a friend for life. I think people should feel like this companion knows them. It remembers the thing that's important to them. It remembers good memories and it can identify when you're trying to express an emotion. You know, a best friend always has your back. He or she always is looking out for your best interests, and that's kind of what Axios is. It's, it's always looking out for your best interests, no matter what age you are. It doesn't see color, race, wealth, it does not matter. It, the, its only task is what's best for you. I think this is such a great tool to help um, discover themselves and discover things they might not realize that um, something that AI and newer technologies can really tap into and uh, help them along. It helps the new kid getting out of college, it helps the kid just starting life, it helps the old person that's trying to keep in touch with their family, it helps the person that doesn't feel like a lot of people talk to them, you know? It's, it's a companion, it's a friend. And that, that's important to people, you know? We keep relationships for a reason. I think that if I had a tool like Axio that would help me see resources that I might not have seen before or give me access to information about you know different schools or different um, jobs that I could apply for. I think that that would be something that would be really helpful and that I would use personally. The idea behind Axio is that people have access to all the information they need to truly succeed in whatever aspect they want to dive into in their life. Innovation, you know, evolves throughout generations and I think that this has the potential to be such a, a pivotal like, piece in young people's lives. So, so the point of this is new ways of teaching. That's a group of students. There's one non-student, uh, Mark Knopfel, who's uh, the leader of what we call the Luminosity Skunk Works, the Luminosity Labs. They have a, they have a booth here uh, at the conference. You can meet a lot of the kids that are working on this project. The, so we're, we're taking literature, science fiction. We're taking normative thinking about the future. We're taking the kinds of outcomes that we wish that we could have, which are machines that can help personalize learning. We're turning to students who are completely transformed. They're not like anything that you imagine of when you were a student. They have complete, complete agency. They can advance projects to their completion. We give them some resources, we assemble them together, and under the new design, they begin working and thinking and designing and creating differently. So one of the fundamental aspects that I hope that people can see is that even the idea of what we think about learning, lifelong learning, engaged learning, what we're calling universal learner, we have an unbelievable opportunity here to change everything if we can just go back and rethink the design. 
So that's the, front, that's the report from the front line, at least from ASU. So uh, thank you very much. Now we're going to uh, introduce three prize winners this year for the Harold W. McGraw Jr. Prize in Education. And if we can go to the first award winner. So Rejma has won the uh, Pre-K-12 Education Prize uh, with her uh, fabulous work in coding for girls. So Rejma, come on up. Second prize, higher education prize is uh, Tim, Tim Rennick from Georgia State University, who's a fantastic genius on rethinking how students can be successful. And lastly, for the first time, the inaugural prize winner in learning sciences, Art Gracier. Art, congratulations. So, start with coding for girls. So, I think people pretty much know what that is. What, I, what, I wanted, what I'd like to know is your thinking about why it is that we are so slow to realize that girls and women, when added to the totality of our social design capability, will alter the trajectory of humanity in very, very significant ways, and, and we don't get it. So, so Enough. So, so, so why do you think that is? What's the actual design constraint that requires that, you know, your, your, your coding for girls is a, is a new design, a workaround of the existing design. What is it about the existing design that is not working? Yeah, in some ways I feel like it's going back to the way that it was. Um, the world's very first programmer was a woman. Yeah. Ada Lovelace. Mm -hmm. You walked, in the 1980s, if you walked into any gaming camp in America, it would have been half boys, half girls. Mm -hmm. so we almost ha had happened? gender parity. Culture, right? You had the birth of the programmer, right, in the 1980s. You know, the white guy who's wearing a hoodie, sitting in a basement somewhere, staring at a computer string, drinking, like, drinking Mountain a Red Dew. Bull. Drinking Mountain yeah. Dew, yeah. Mm -hmm. And little girls, and you saw him in War Games and Revenge of the Nerds and... Little girls looked at that image and they said, you know, not only do I not want to be him, I don't even want to be friends with him. So decade after decade after decade, we've basically turned girls off of going into this field. Mm -hmm. And we've done a poor job of describing what computer science is. No. And we're changing that across. Well, I, men I mentioned to you last night when we were talking that, you know, we've grown engineering at ASU from 8,000 students to 21,000 students. And, uh, in the last few years, and one of the ways that we, with thousands and thousands of more uh, women in engineering, because we redesigned what it is and how it's perceived and what they're, what they're focused on, starting with the names, the structure, everything. Yeah. So we think it is about the culture. Absolutely. I mean, I saw so many diverse faces in that video, building incredible things, and mm -hmm. we've learned the same thing. We've taught 90,000 girls over the past six years in 50 states. Um, to put that into perspective, uh, only 10,000 women graduated in computer science last year. So this is possible. You know, very, you know, very few times in your life do you get the opportunity to solve a problem in a generation, and we have one. And we and so many other incredible organizations are, are solving this problem. So I'm hopeful. Like, I'm hopeful that all of those faces, right, can be yeah. women and women of color. Right. So, uh, Tim, you, you were educated at... Uh uh, highly selective universities. You got your PhD at Princeton. You grew up, uh, you know, at the top of your game, you know, analytically and uh, philosophically. And you, you know, you're a philosopher uh, and a scholar of uh, really complex ideas. And now you're devoting your life to, um, you know, a frontline public uh, urban university in a highly diverse community. So, what is it about the culture of academia that uh, leads you to? Uh, in a sense, have to face this social hierarchy in academia where there's the good schools and the not-so-good schools and the not-so-good schools, which all appear to be about selectivity. What is it about higher education? Well, I think one thing I learned uh, at those previous institutions, and it's one thing that was reflected in your comments just a minute ago, is that we know what works in education. Students need individualized attention. They need immediate feedback. 
They need to be able to interact and experience. And the reality is places like Georgia State, big public universities where 52,000 students, uh, a majority uh, minority institution, almost 70% of our students are non-white, typically haven't been resourced in order to deliver that kind of personalized service. So, you know, a personal challenge to me uh, building upon my background is how can we deliver to students what they deserve? So that, by the way, goes back to my thing about design. It wasn't resource because people didn't want to resource it. Yeah, we, we've uh, spent a <laughs> lot of time over the last generation trying to get students college ready. And what we've tried to do at Georgia State, and I know ASU is I uh, engaged in the same design process, is say, what does it look like for a college to be student ready? You know, mm -hmm. how do we deliver services at scale for reasonable cost? We launched a chatbot uh, uh, two years ago so we could give immediate answers to our coming freshmen. In the first three months, we had 200,000 questions answered for the freshman class alone. We're tracking every student every day for 800 different risk factors and reaching out to them in mass when they go off path before they make fatal mistakes that are going to lead to them dropping out. Over the last five years, we've had over 200,000 interventions. But we're not a well-resourced institution, and the challenge that a place like Georgia State poses to the whole post-secondary sector is, why not? You know, Resor why well, you resources same? don't have to mean money. Resources can mean ideas or designs. And so, Art, uh, talk a little bit about, uh, so you're interesting. So you're one of these, these uh, polymathic types, you know, and so you've been thinking about how to integrate all these things. So the question I have for you is, uh, what is it that we don't know about learning that we really ought to know uh, as we enter into this technological age where uh, ubiquitous access to information is going to be uh, un like never before? So what is it about learning, human learning, that we don't generally know relative to our design that you think we ought to think about? Well, I think one uh, problem has been the big classrooms. I think that was created around the Industrial Revolution to disseminate shallow knowledge. Mm -hmm. And so you really should have classrooms for, to inspire and to expose people to ideas. However, that does not provide deep learning, systems thinking, causal analysis. And, and you know, deep learning is hard. So every mind is on their own trajectory. You can't do that in a classroom. You can't. You have to have personalized, intelligent tutoring systems so it can kind of go along your own mental trajectory. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to find ways to go into the knowledge revolution uh, because we're gone beyond the industrial revolution into the knowledge revolution. So we really got to design higher education more towards smaller groups creating things in an interdiscipl interdisciplinary arena rather than big classrooms. That's fine for entertainment and exposure to shallow knowledge, but no. that's not deep. So, uh, yes, yes, let's agree with that. <laughs> so, uh, Reshma, so, so uh, you've been on the front line, you know, bringing about change. You're trying to bring us back to this, uh, to this uh, broader particip participation of girls and women uh, that we have had in the past that we moved away from because of culture shifts. So, so what's a couple ideas that you wish people like the people attending this meeting uh, should work on? What are, what's a couple ideas? What should we be doing? Sure. So one, I think we need to get computer science education to every student in middle school. So computer science education to every student. So on my chart, I said math and science literacy for everyone, and I'd put computer science under that Great. so they understand how these machines work. Yeah. Second, you got to track gender and race. So Track less, it. So you got to know who's doing it. you got to know who's doing it. Mm -hmm. And I think the third thing is, is you can't, you can't uh, we need to emphasize the importance of role models. You cannot be what you cannot see. And so we need to make sure that we're telling these stories of Ada Lovelace and the ENIAC women and the incredible mm -hmm. women mm -hmm. and people of color that are at the forefront of math and science and technology, mm -hmm. and we need to share those stories. Okay. So Tim, uh, you've got uh, a lot of people out here who are building, investing, designing, making things happen. So you saw my wish list. Uh, got a lot of things on it. I hope people are paying attention to it because there's you know, money involved also. There's, you know, we need technologies. There's a market for these technologies. Let's make things happen. What do you need that you don't have? What do you wish you had that no one has built yet? Yeah, well, we're working now uh, increasingly in the financial range. So how do we 
do the same kind of tracking that we've gotten better and better at across this room in the academic realm with helping students make the right financial decisions, knowing when they're going off path financially, and being able to deliver timely interventions to students so they don't make these mistakes that ultimately lead to them dropping out. We found that some students, before they even set foot on campus, have already made decisions that are going to determine that they're not going to graduate from Georgia State by taking uh, a housing choice that they can't afford, and that basically means they're going to drop out in March of their first year. So, uh, Art, last question to you, and then we're out of time. Uh, so you're the, the leader of the Institute of Intelligent Systems. Mm -hmm. and so you're a designer driven by science and scientific understanding. So you're a science-driven designer. Uh, what's our biggest error that we need to design around, other than the shallow learning, big classrooms, Michel Foucault-constrained, you know, technologically-based uh, failed learning systems? What, what, what does your, all of your insight, all of your, your experience in intelligent systems tell you that we need to really address? I think we need to address the value of what we're learning. And that's not often done. Uh, so, like that the lear so that the learner can understand the value. Yeah, yeah. they understand the value. Uh, we do a lot of just-in-case learning. Mm -hmm. So they give you information just in case it's important. But why not have some sense of where this learning is going to take you for your future and through your entire life? Okay. And I'm glad you showed the Axio uh, the, you know, yeah. uh, video yeah, yeah. because in, whether it's the military or universities, they're wondering about how to uh, kind of recommend things throughout their life. And value of what they're learning mm -hmm. is very important to it. Well, let's thank the McGraw Prize winners for this year.